Welcome to everyone for coming along. We're, we're really excited to run this session in conjunction with Steve um, and, and Archistar. So basically just some quick intros. You know, my name's Rob Curry. I'm the co-founder of Archistar. Um, we've got Steve from the Property Development Institute and um, also he runs Lefter as well. And then we've got Andrew Wilson, who's the chief economist at Archistar. So you've got um, an interesting panel today. We're all, we're all very opinionated, so you'll get lots of opinions. And, um, and what, what a year it's been. You know, maybe Andrew, do you want to maybe jump in and maybe, you know, how did you see 2020 kind of play out from your end from a, you know, my, like an economic perspective? Well, I'm sort of sick of the word roller coaster, Rob, but um, we, we can only really describe 2020 as a roller coaster. And unfortunately, the roller coaster has continued right until the, uh, the end of the year. Um, not so much for the housing market, but of course, for the major constraint that we've had on our housing market uh, and our uh, and our economy earlier in the year, of course, and that was the shutdown energy. But um, it was interesting, of course, that um, post the shutdown, and of course, that was uh, uh, autumn, once we moved into winter, our housing markets really did respond uh, quite quickly. Uh, it really did reinforce that the underlying factors of the housing market weren't really affected by the shutdown environment that uh, we if we remember back we started the year off quite strongly particularly in Sydney and Melbourne but most capital city markets were growing and that was a continuation of last year uh, and of course when the shutdown came it was particularly the physical restrictions on transactions that uh, impeded activity no surprise there but as I said before once those physical restrictions were <coughs> eased um, our housing markets were up and running again and interestingly we finished the year as strong as we've been for a number of years. Uh, last weekend's auction results were quite extraordinary. Um, we, are, we were only six days out of Christmas, and yet uh, we had nearly 900 properties under the hammer in Melbourne, 600 in Sydney, and also uh, quite reasonable numbers in Canberra, Brisbane, and Adelaide. And uh, auction clearance rates, Melbourne recorded one of its highest for the year. In fact, uh, actual auction sales were probably the highest last Saturday for the year. Um, and again, Sydney was just under 80% clearance rates. So, uh, and the, the smaller markets, uh, Brisbane, quite extraordinary clearance rate of over 70%, which is very unusual for that market. But auction activity in Brisbane, in terms of the number of auction sales or the clearance rate, has been extraordinary over the last two months. And uh, that's a very hot market at the moment, but also Adelaide and Canberra have been very strong as well. So really, you know, uh, the markets bounced back very strongly. Uh, I think we'll see uh, more positive price growth uh, being reported over the December quarter. And, um, you know, again, we've seen a similar result from the economy. And, and that's part of the equation. I, I don't want to overstate the relationship between the economic activity, particularly the fiscal support that we had through JobKeeper and other bits and pieces on the, uh, on the rebound in the housing market. The, typically that cohort, I guess, that were uh, needing income support weren't really in the market for property one way or the other. And um, uh, so it, it was just a, a revisiting uh, of that underlying energy that we started the year off with once those restrictions were eased rather than, and of course, confidence was important with the market, uh, with the economy improving as rapidly as it has. Uh, but I think we're all set next year, Rob, for um, a continuation of activity. Fingers crossed on the shutdown, of course, that we can um, start getting rid of those borders that were closed uh, last week or just a few days ago into Sydney. Uh, and, um, you know, the story will tell will be revealed over the next couple of days as to the control of that spread at the moment. But um, there's no doubt that notwithstanding the um, control of coronavirus, that uh, we are in for a... Uh, uh, a continuation of strong growth. Why are we seeing strong growth in our housing markets over the last couple of years? Well, particularly, or certainly over the last 12 months, notwithstanding what happened with the shutdown, is that uh, our the values of Melbourne and Sydney house prices are still 5% lower than where they were in 2017. And since then, of course, we've had a number of interest rate cuts, incomes have grown. So the actual real measures of affordability are still very much within the buyer uh, in the um, uh, favour of buyers. And that's why we're continuing to see um, uh, rising activity in our housing markets, particularly in Melbourne and Sydney. I think that overall, most of our capital city markets will grow by around about 5 to 7% next year. I think those markets with uh, upside 
potential beyond that are Brisbane and Perth. Uh, and they're being driven by quite strong uh, activity in terms of uh, interstate migration. And although that tends to be a longer term driver of house prices, it's still feeding its way into demand for property uh, from Sydney uh, for, uh, into Brisbane and Perth. And uh, of course, you know, we may see that exacerbated through those perceptions of uh, Perth and Brisbane being a safe haven destination for, uh, for those from other capitals, particularly Melbourne and perhaps Sydney. But um, the economy has, uh, has been an extraordinary result for us, Rob, this year. Um, I, I tracked, I, I did analysis of the latest unemployment data last uh, week that was released from November. Since, um, uh, since June, we've seen uh, the creation of 700,000 jobs in Australia. We've also seen a return to the workforce of 700,000, nearly 700,000 as well. So that, that's quite remarkable. Of course, our unemployment rate is down to 6.8%. Uh, still more to come into the workforce. Uh, if we look at the, the actual change in the uh, number of employed since um, uh, comparing it to the pre-shutdown period, in March, um, we're only a, a fraction of a percent in all states below where we were in March in terms of the number of employed, uh, and with the exception of Victoria, which is no surprise is still 2.1% lower than where they were uh, in terms of the number of employed in March. Uh, but of course, they're in uh, catch up mode still, uh, given they've only come out of uh, lockdown over the past uh, two, two months. But uh, the participation rate, which of course measures the proportion of those that are either in work or looking for work uh, of, of, from the uh, overall population, uh, is now just about back to where it was in every state, um, with the exception of Victoria, where it was back in March. In fact, the participation rate in Western Australia is now higher than where it was back in March. Now, these are, are really incredible figures. Uh, we've come back stronger than uh, we, we could have believed, I guess, um, but we didn't know what to believe, you know, in those uncertain yeah. times. Uh, and it really is, is um, you know, uh, uh, the gold standard Australia remains uh, for its economic performance. Uh, the share market, uh, other than the hiccup this week, was looking to recover to its pre-coronavirus peaks of this year. Again, a remarkable result. And our dollar is pushing up towards... 76 cents now, which is just extraordinary. Um, another, I, I guess, another tick from international investors in terms of their regard for what's happening, uh, what's happening in our economy. So roller coaster ride, uh, Rob, let's hope it doesn't continue next year and it's onwards and upwards, but certainly all the data points to being a very positive year for the economy and the housing <coughs> markets generally next year. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Really comprehensive summary. And um, yeah, look, looks positive for next year as well. And I suppose, Steve, from a developers perspective so you know you do your own developments and you've also got a lot of students that you work with who are getting started with development how how would you summarize 2020 yeah i, I would summarize 2020 as an interesting year so you know because i've been around for 40 years uh you know I've, I've been through COVID now i've been through the gfc i've been through you know, a recession in the early 90s, the, the share market crash of 87, the, the recession back in the early 80s. So, you know, I've been through this roller coaster, as, as, as Andrew said, you know, like it, it's just, you know, what, what we, you know, like what we, <clears throat> we never want to see it go down. We always want to see everything going up and up and up and being perfectly, perfectly fantastic without the hiccups. But re reality is everything goes up and down. Um, for me, it was just another year. Um, it, it started very badly for me because I had a development that I was about to start. <clears throat> um, and, and, you know, my capital partner on that project pulled the pin when they um, saw COVID. We had our shutdown and it was like, well, hang on a minute. We're not going to put a dollar in until we know what's happening. So it, it created uncertainty in our market. Um, I, I think... You know, if you look at the what, what Andrew was saying about the, the housing market, realistically, people were, you know, disappeared out of the, uh, if you look at the residential side, out of the, the pre-sale market, not willing to buy off the plan because there was uncertainty, at least with houses or apartments when you can, you know, walk into it and touch and feel, it's completely different. So, 
that market sort of stayed there, but look, pre-sales certainly certainly dropped off. Um, that created uncertainty as far as developers were concerned. It sort of it, it, it forced developers to really look at the build to rent side of things. And it's like when you've got a machine that's got to go where you've, you've acquired a site, you've committed to you know, one or, or, or more sites, depending on the size of your, 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 your company, um, you just got to keep going. And sometimes it's a matter of, okay, well, we'll, we'll change our mind from you know, selling model to, to hold. We'll develop it if we can't sell it later on we'll hold it for a couple of years while the market recovers. So I, I was talking to a lot of people and I saw a few projects popping up like that. Um, it also gave you know, the, the, the top end of town time to actually focus on build to rent and to try and you know, make it viable. You know, there's, there's two trains of thought, you know, it's government and tax that's stopping build to rent in Australia from being uh, viable. And the other side of it is, well, Mm, no, it's the whole structure of how build to rent works, and the fact that it's um, you know difficult to get a uh, an individual to commit to a, a five year lease that also creates you know some of the problems. So it's very very structurally different from what they're doing overseas. So I think there's uh, going to be quite a bit of time before build to rent really sort of embeds in Australia. So to me, 2020 was uh, an opportunity for developers to actually look at build to rent seriously. Um, gave them heaps of opportunity and, you know, a couple of them have really jumped on it and, and are pushing forward. And that's fantastic. You know, if it, if it, you know, if there's a market for it, then, you know, great. Let's see them, see them work on that. Um, for, you know, ordinary development, if you like, just the standard develop apartments to, to sell, it's obviously been a really tough time because pre-sales due to the uncertainty of, of what's happening has, has really, uh, have really dropped off. A lot of developers sort of backed away, didn't commit to sites, you know, parked them. So there's quite a, a, a backlog of potential developments, DA approved or permit approved um, developments that are sitting out there that are just waiting, waiting for the economy to, to recover to a point where those developers are confident enough to inject the balance of the capital needed, <clears throat> needed to be able to take it forward. So I, I, I look at 2020 and to me, lots of, lots of lessons about, you know, if, if you're going to get into development, here's my, my training hack coming back on. Um, if you're going to get into development, you, you, you really have to form a view. Uh, you have to listen to people such as Andrew and, and, and what he, he gave us as an overview of the economy. Listen to, you know, experts who, who look at, economics and see what's happening globally and you know bringing that information and funneling funneling it all the way down from a you know what's happening at a global perspective into what's happening in a, in a, in a national perspective then into your state then into your, your local government area and then into the location where you're actually going to develop is understanding you know that the macroeconomic impacts of what's happening all the way down to the microeconomic impacts that are, that are going to affect your project in your suburb in the in the you know, region directly where you're actually developing. So understanding the impact and forming your own view about what's going to happen um, is phenomenal. So you know, like two, year, two weeks ago, uh, I did a, uh, an evening uh, presentation um, and one of the slides that I showed, I was talking about the secrets to property developers, you know, making the, the big bucks you hear about. And one of the slides I put up was just something that showed people it was about risk in property development. And it showed sort of the 20 years from uh, 97 to 2017. And it showed the up and down, the GFC and all that sort of stuff and price movement over that period of time. And, you know, yeah, okay, generally line of best fit, it was going up at, you know, I don't know, give or take 7% per annum. Um, but you had these ups and downs, ups and downs along the way. But in that whole process, if you look at apartments only, there was only one phase where uh, over about an 18 month period, and I can't remember what the year was now, but it dropped about 8.9% over that period of time. So if you've got a, a reasonable profit margin and you haven't stuffed up your acquisition ideology and you know rushed into a site because you thought it was good instead of you know practicing proper property development um, techniques you know 8.9 percent it's not going to kill you. you know, so 
it, it's going to hurt, obviously, but you're not going to lose money, you know, if you've got a decent margin. And, you know, thank God that financiers don't lend us money unless we've got a decent margin because they don't want to lose their money either. So, you know, it, it, it's quite interesting when you look back at that and good property developers will develop through cycles. You know, look, look at all the, 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 the large guys, the big guys in the, in the industry. They don't just stop because things get tough. They just keep going. You know? and, and they're always there to, you know, they're always acquiring the good sites because if they can buy one, you know, in the bottom of the cycle, then up we go. They've got that for the high cycle. And if they acquire a site at the high cycle, it just means that, you know, as long as they bought it for a reasonable price at that time, well, if the market comes down, they're still going to make a margin. So it's, you know, very, very interesting. So to me, 2020 was just another year where, you know, it dipped, it created an issue. But what's really been interesting is that the economy has recovered so quickly, uh, given what we've got. So for me, 2020 started quite well because we had the six months of of growth, the, the market coming back, everything was, you know, looking roses. You know, February, March, we fell off the edge of a cliff with uncertainty. Now we have certainty. You know, we've got the promise of the vaccine and stuff like that, um, you know, for, for next year. So next year, still got some challenges. So, but Rob, can I ask you a question then, since you've yeah, asked me yeah, about 2020? Of, yeah, I'll, I'll go on the other seat, yeah. Look, you're, you're, you're prop tech, right? You're, you're not developer, you're, you're prop tech. You're, you're, you're technology that helps us in the industry. So like, from your perspective, what, what have you guys really learned or got out of 2020 from the development of what you're, you're creating? Yeah, well, I think for us, it's... Um it's forced us to get even closer to our clients um, and, and really understand what's going on um, in their businesses and, and how we can tweak the software to help them out. So, you know, when COVID hit in March, April, we lost about 10% of our client base straight away. And then we had scenarios where we had, you know, a COVID one, a COVID two, all the way up to about COVID six. So like, you know, we, we had scenario planning for, you know, how long, um, like ha how many customers we might lose and, and how bad the, the whole um, COVID might get. But re really happily for us, um, we only got to COVID-1, which was a 10% drop in client base. And then we've, um, we've now doubled where we were pre-COVID. So um, we've been really fortunate that, you know, we haven't had to lose any staff. Um, we've, we've actually grown the team, almost doubled the team in this year. So, um, and we've doubled the business as well. So yeah, by, um, I, th I think I kind of agree with both of your sentiments. Like it was a bit of a wobbly start and then, you know, the economy's come back pretty good. Um, yeah, and I think from our perspective, um, we've really worked on some tools that help with, um, you know, like as much as you can do from your desktop or your laptop. So like as an example, like as soon as COVID hit, we fast tracked a measuring tool into the platform because that was a, a requested tool. And because COVID hit, like a lot of valuers and agents couldn't get out to home. So we put the measuring tool on there and that satisfied a lot of demand um, for that kind of market. So Things like that we've been putting in, like we've fast-tracked putting in additional layers into the platform so that people can, again, view more from their desktop or laptop. And um, yeah, and we've got, we've got a big pipeline ahead of work for 2021. And I think, um, yeah, like I'm, I'm kind of curious to hear from you, you as well, Steve, how with, with the small developers, what did you see from them? Like obviously the big ones, you know, they, they would have been a bit rocky, but they've got stronger balance sheets and can kind of weather a storm a bit. But you know, the people just getting started or, or early stage developers, how did they find it? Yeah, it was interesting. When, when COVID first hit, um, all of the, the courses that we offered basically died. You know, everyone's gone, oh, don't know what's going to happen. You know, I don't want to be a property developer. You know, like, bang. And it's it sort of our, our, the market, if you like, our sales vanished. Um, but then it, it was interesting because then it just came back. Um, after a, a few months where, you know, the, the shock was over and people have gone, okay, this is interesting. Um, look, same thing for me, you know, when, when, when I got through the shock of, you know, what the hell is going on here? Um, you know, and it's like, huh? okay. And I started to form a view, you know, and, and I, I just keep you know, hammering to people. You've got to form a view, you've got to form a view. And as a developer, you, you know, if you don't form a view, 
you, you, you're a sheep. You're just following somebody else's path. You know, I'll, I'll listen to as many people who, who, you know, I, I can get a hold of that'll tell me their opinions and what it's based on. Um, but I'm, I'm the developer. I've got to form the view on, on what I'm going to do. So I found that, you know, probably mid year, we started to get numbers coming back. Um, you know, that when, you know, in July, when we had the, um, the advent in New South Wales of the low rise housing diversity code, when it went from only applicable in a few suburbs of uh, suburbs, a few LGAs around uh, New South Wales, when it became across the state, the interest in that was, was huge uh, because you know, who wouldn't want to develop something without a DA? So that, that was fantastic. So there's a lot of interest in that. And I think, funnily enough, I think that was a real turning point from a, for a lot of people is that the opportunity to do things much faster. So a lot more of the inquiry came, came through that. And then people who attended courses, et cetera, you know, we, we talked about COVID and we talked about risk. And, and when it comes down to it, what, what we do as developers is risk management. And, you know, risk management is not a sexy topic. You know, there are very few people that go, oh, you know, I want to be a risk manager and, you know, for the, all of my life. But um, you know, that's what we do. You know, we, we, we get information. We, we make decisions. You know, I always talk about, you know, here's my crystal ball. Um, you know, I have a look at it. What's going to happen tomorrow? I have no idea. Well, how the hell do you you plug into a project and commit your capital? You know, when payday might not be for two or three years from now. How do you do that? And you do it through risk management. That's it. Yeah. So, you know, everyone goes on about, oh, you know, how do you? You know, I can't believe it. You know, and it, but it's true. When you pull out that chart that I had, and maybe I should have actually had that to throw up today, but. Um, the chart that just shows those numbers not, um, you know, not dropping by more than 8.9%, you know, it, it just, that's the sort of thing that people need to see because if you go into a development project with the right margin and, and not being, you know, going through life with rose colored glasses, you know, getting independent experts to, to help you like, you know, on the call, you know, the person who does all of my, you know, research, my market research for me is on this call. You know, like that, that, that is key to making money. Having someone independent look at something who doesn't have a vested interest in an outcome on a project, geez, that, it, it makes the world a difference. Uh, that, that this, this person did some uh, research on a, a couple of uh, locations for me in New South Wales recently and their research destroyed the feasibility. And you know what? Great. That's fantastic because those projects that you don't do are the ones that actually make you money in the long run. So it was, it was very, very good to have that. So to me, the, the thing that people have sort of started to, to sort of, the fear's gone. Uh, people are now looking forward to, you know, what's coming in, in 2021. And I suppose that's the... Um, uh, maybe a segue for us to actually really start talking about next year and what yeah, what we're all going to do. So, um, Rob, yeah, do you thanks, Steve. tell us what, yeah. what what have you got got on the you know like what's in your crystal ball for 2021 about you know what's going to happen and then what are you guys going to um, add into the market from from your platform side of things? Yeah, so it's an interesting year for us coming up. We've got um, where 2021 for us, like, I suppose we're, we, we haven't got um, massive, like, negative um, plans in place. Like, so it's all positive and growth focused going forward. So, um, again, we're looking to grow the team again, looking to double revenue again. So, um, pretty aggressive goals uh, for the next 12 months. I think for us, um, we're looking to do a lot of work in the US and the UK, so launching those markets in the first quarter. So, it's going to be interesting to see how, how COVID affects them and, um, and and how they're rebounding from that because I know it, it's pretty bad in both those countries at the moment. Mm -hmm. And then um, on the on the product side of things, you know, a big request from us is uh, people want to customize a platform themselves. So they want to put their own feasibility model in. They want to put their own generative designs in. They want to put their own layers in, their own listings, their own you know, kind of points on the map. 
So we're pretty much opening up the whole platform and allowing people to customize it to their heart's content. So if they've got a fancy wancy, you know, Excel feasibility they spent three years perfecting, great. They can load that into the system. Um, we can pull in the formulas and then the feasibility will be customized to, to the way they do it. So it's all that customizability. Um, we're going to do a lot more work with government as well next year. So we've got a couple of good contracts and um, focusing more on like, you know, housing forecast models and um, things like, um, you know, automatic compliance of buildings. So yeah, it's going to be a big um, 2021 in government side of things as well. Okay. Uh, yeah. You know, how, how do you, I mean, how do you, Oh, well, one, one thing I'll say is if you're expanding into the UK and the US now, uh, there's only going to be good news from that. So, you know, you go in when things are really bad and you survive through that and you grow as the country comes out of, you know, their depths of yeah, despair. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Oh, mate, that's going to be ace. It's going to be fantastic. So I'm, lo I'm looking forward to the opportunity of working with you overseas then. So yeah, maybe, we, maybe for, you can do a, yeah, you can do a, well, once, a, once the travel comes down, you might do a, a bit of a visit for us. <laughs> with right, a what, what a good idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a great idea. Great idea. I, I, look, I look at 2021 and, and, and I'm, I'm optimistic, absolutely optimistic about 2021. I, I look at, you know, my, my views around the, 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 the vaccines and stuff, you know, I'm, I'm not, a big believer in in that but that doesn't mean that i can't believe that a lot of people believe so yeah a lot of people believe in the vaccine and when it was announced what, a, a month or so ago that hey you know we got 90 percent, 95 percent efficacy and all that sort of stuff uh and that you yeah, know we're going to have have a, a, a something rolling out in march next year in australia um the, the confidence out of a lot of people is, is just massive so I, I looked at that and, and talking to people, there are heaps of people that I talk to go like, you know, that's fantastic. You know, I'm going to queue up. I'm going to get my jab. Um, you know, I'm going to have that. It just, you know, it just made such a difference for a substantial proportion of the population. So from a confidence perspective, you look at, you know, the, the federal budget was pretty good. The state budgets have, have been pretty good at spending money. You know, obviously we're going to have the issue in the future of paying it down, but all of this sort of support that's going into the community has been massive. So uh, it's been well received by business. Andrew, you know, attested to that with what, what's happening, you know, in Australia, all over the place. So come March, you know, we, we, we see if, if we do get that vaccine in Australia, you know, give or take around March, that, that'd be fantastic. Um, question mark for me still sits around the end of JobKeeper um what's going to happen then uh, are we going to have a flood of unemployed in the numbers in april i i don't know um i think a lot will depend on what sort of happens with like what we've got in new south wales in, in sydney at the moment with um you know the what appears to me an overreaction to a, uh, a small number of COVID cases but you know maybe better an overreaction to try and contain it than than have it get too big but I, I just think that if we don't have too many more outbreaks and too many more border closures, 2021 is going to be a massive year. Um, immigration, we know that immigration is is basically zero at the moment because you know, international borders virtually closed. Um, you know, and if you look back at the budget numbers, what they were talking about immigration, we're going to have low levels of immigration in uh, 2021 and sort of getting back up in 2022, 2023. So... To me, I still believe it's, but there's a bit of pent up demand in the, in the residential apartment market. Um, is it enough to drive price growth in, in apartments? Well, I, I don't necessarily think so. I think housing, as Andrew said, um, you know, it is going to you know, grow in, in price next year. Uh, I don't know that apartments are necessarily gonna grow in price, but I think we've got solid sales capability coming into, into next year. Um, obviously, this is you know, depending on the on, on the specific markets, but generally speaking, uh, across the board, um, I actually see the apartment market, you know, just being solid, not booming. You know, I, the last thing we want is actually a boom. Um, you know, I just see it being solid. Affordability, you know, it keeps it affordable, so people will buy it. 
that that's really important. Again, that's what Andrew mentioned before about affordability is is, is still okay compared to what it was a couple of years ago. Um, so to me, I, I'm I'm really confident about 2021. Not you know shooting shooting off and you know us making 20 30 percent you know out of our property prices, but I'm actually confident that we'll have in the apartment market a solid year. Um, if you look at um, industrial, I see industrial continuing to grow. One of the, one of the issues then to be dealt with in industrial, particularly in Sydney, is, is Badgerys Creek. You know, we've got a massive amount of land going out there, so you know, price driver will will depend on you know what's happening with the airport um, out there. But I, I just see generally industrial is going to be you know continue to be the the darling. Of the market, it's been the darling through COVID because we're all, you know, ordering stuff from home. Um, I think the sooner that we get um, home delivered toilet paper, it's going to be better for the people of Sydney because this stupidity about bloody <laughs> rushing out and you know cleaning out the shelves is is ridiculous. Um, but I, yeah, look, I'm 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 actually really um, yeah you know, looking forward to 2021. I've got a couple of potential developments that uh, I'm going to be, you know. I think locking into by February, um, and those are the things that I don't tell people about. So you know they can hear about my left of business and my property development institute business, but very few people actually hear about what what I actually do behind the scenes. So, but you know there's a couple of you know 30 to 50 unit developments that I'm looking and actually getting started. I, I think that from that perspective, that should tell people that you know. I'm confident enough to actually look at doing a couple of developments next year more if I can get my hands on some decent sites. So um, I, I'm, I'm ready for it. I'm ready. Absolutely. That's great. No, that's really good. I suppose maybe circle back to Andrew. Um, Andrew, like, you know, we've had this little wobble in, in Sydney in the last week or so. Have you got any data yet um, from like listings or, or any sold data um, to, to show any impact of that yet? Or is it too early to, to see that? Well, just guys, some breaking news come through that they've just announced uh, eight new cases in Sydney uh, of local transmissions today, which of course is half again from yesterday. They conducted 44,000 tests, which is a record. So that's a really, really good result uh, in terms of the trend uh, going forward. So uh, that situation is improving uh, quite rapidly. Of course, we need to wait a few days before a trend evolves. So. Um, some, just some breaking news there on, uh, on a very sharp reduction in new cases. They were all in the northern beaches too. Um, so, well, yeah, and from 44,000 tests yesterday. But as far as, um, you know, activity, uh, I'm not sure we're in holiday mode anyway, Rob, most of us. Yeah. Uh, but we would have all been, you know, thinking about what colour bathers we're going to wear over mm -hmm. the next couple of weeks but um, or what sort of an umbrella we'd have in Melbourne. But... Um, uh, I think that, you know, we're not going to see any real response from the housing market until it starts to regenerate itself late January and into February. But um, uh, I think lessons learned as well. There was a lot of nonsense spoken during the shutdown period about, A, the prospects for the economy and the housing market. There's a lot of embarrassed so-called experts out there now that have taken the road to Damascus, Damascus and... Uh, you know, are now on the boom, uh, the boom road for 2021. Uh, but um, we won't have a boom next year, but we're going to have a very solid result uh, across the board. And this is good news. If we can control any of these mini outbreaks uh, of COVID, it'll give people uh, more confidence. But um, it was interesting just talking about the latest results, Rob, that uh, the, the real surge in activity we've had towards the end of the year means that there's still unsatisfied demand out there because of course we do shut down for the next two months or six weeks and uh, I think buyers will be up and up and running again uh, next year uh, and also the prospect is of course that we won't see any changes to interest rates next year we've come to the bottom of the interest rate cycle now so that's another really good thing for certainty going forward um, and the Reserve Bank Governor has quite clearly stated that he expects interest rates to remain where they are or they will remain where they are for the next three years. And of course, that old bogey in the market, oh yeah, what if interest rates rise, can, cannot be used anymore as a sort of leverage to not get involved. And um, I even think that, you know, the issues over the change or the end to the job seeker allowance in March, 
Uh, again, if we look this year, really the higher levels of unemployment haven't impacted the market uh, at all. And I think that um, those that, uh, you know, have to move onto unemployment benefits from job seeker, I, I think they'll have any impact at all on the housing market. Uh, it never really does. In fact, higher unemployment usually leads to higher house prices, believe it or not. Um, and um, that's usually because we get lower interest rates, which of course we can't do now. So I, I think in a logical sense, you know, the prospects for next year uh, are certainly positive. And uh, given that latest news that uh, hopefully means that we're gonna control the Sydney outbreak sooner rather than later, can give us some um, really even more confidence going forward, Rob. But just another factor is that new listings that I track on a daily basis are still around about 15% uh, higher than where they were over the same time last year. They've certainly fallen yeah. quite sharply over the last few weeks, as you would expect, uh, given the oncoming holiday period, but they're still well ahead of where they were a year ago. Yeah, super interesting. And Steve, I suppose, you know, there's a big announcement from the government, you know, on, um, you know, July saying, you know, the new low rise code is live now, et cetera. What's been um, your kind of view on, on how that's, that's played out, you know, with duplexes and terraces and, and manor houses. Has that been, um, have you seen any success in that area? Or is it just other rules are too restrictive to make it viable? You know, I, I think a, there was a substantial amount of interest that, you know, we, we had a, we, we did a joint webinar on that back in July as well. And, you know, it was a massive amount of interest. Um, I've seen nothing. Um, you know, I've, I've got a building company that specialises in delivering that type of um, construction on the manor house, which is the four, the four units on a single lot. And what, what we found is that, you know, some of the people that we talk to say, oh, you know, I'd rather do a DA. And it's like, why would you rather do a DA? And, oh, yeah. well, you know, I've lived next door to these people for 20 years. I'd, I'd hate to upset them, you know, that... That type of thing. It's, it's quite, that, that was bizarre. Um, yeah. From a development perspective, it's, look, the, the small scale residential projects are difficult to um, make them viable uh, as, a, uh, as a development proposition if you sort of engage a third party property, you know, property development manager or a project manager, et cetera, which means that at, at that end, at the, the duplex, you know, whether you do a couple of townies or, or townhouses or, or something of that nature, the difficulty is when you do a project like that, it's a great location, a great size to start for, for people in property development. It just, it can, it can affect your employment because you, you can imagine every day the builder's got a problem and you need to deal with that problem. So you've got to be on the site at you know, seven o'clock in the morning to talk to the builder about the issues during the day. You've got to be available during the day. You know, maybe you drop in after work every day. I mean, the builder won't be there by the time you, you know, if you've got an office job, by the time you get home at, you know, or get to the site at six o'clock at night, you know, the builder's long gone. Um, but it, it takes a lot out of you. And I think a lot of people are actually worried about that. And that's, look, it's, it's, a, it's a genuine issue. So it does slow people down. The more, more of that sort of very, very small medium density stuff is, is done by people who actually own the property and then want to build a duplex or something like that. That tends to be what, what's happening because of the demand. You know? And that's one of the reasons why I create a green note with a business partner to address that issue and do a sort of that, that done for you development scenario where we'll look all, uh, you know, look after all of the, the design and de delivery side of it. Well, I, I, I still think it's a, a great place to start development. And if you don't start small, you make it more difficult for yourself to, to start large unless you're, you know, pooling your money with others to, you know, do a 30 unit development or something like that where you can actually afford to engage with someone else to run the project for you. So I, you know, I've, I've not seen much happen in, in that low rise, medium density housing code uh, scenario at all. It's been very, very quiet. Uh, and, and talking to financiers, same thing. They're not funding them because there's not many out there. So yeah, it's interesting. Very interesting. I'm, I'm, 
I think it's a fantastic idea and it's definitely something that I'll be doing myself personally. I'll be working, working within the code um, probably next year. Yep. Cool. All right. Um, I think like that was the main questions I had. Did you have any final kind of comments or thoughts, Steve, um, before we wrap up? Uh, I think my, my view or my sort of a wrap up comment, if you like, look, I, 2021 is what it's all, you know, this year that's gone, it's gone. You know, we don't need to worry about that anymore. We just got to look forward. Um, obviously COVID is the thing that is going to, you know, pop up, you know, every now and then, like it's done on the Northern beaches. Um, as Andrew has said, you know, like, you know, the numbers gone from 30 to 15 to eight, you know, they might drop down to four, they might drop down to two, they might pop back up to eight again, you know, who knows? Um, I think we've got to just get on with life. You know, this is going to happen. Um, we're going to have to just deal with COVID. No, uh, it's just just like we used to deal with the flu. You get the flu, you stay at home. Um, those type of scenarios. As soon as people just sort of toughen up a bit on it and just go, okay, I've got to deal with this. It, it, it's fine, and not go racing off to the shopping centre and get toilet paper. You know, it, 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 toilet paper won't save you. Right? So, I think we're going to be in for a, a year of topsy turvy next year. Um, I, I do believe that we're, we're going to have, you know, the vaccine will come out and for those who want it, fantastic. That's great. It just adds confidence. And if we've got confidence in the market, we've got confidence in the government, you know, the, the economy is going to go great. You know, okay. We, you know, we might have, you know, something we haven't talked about is China. Um, you know, China is a, a major problem with us. You know, they're, they're a third of our trade. Um, you know, the US happens to be a third of our trade too. So, you know, like, just, just think about that. You know, two countries are two thirds of our, our trade out of this country. So that's putting a lot of eggs in two baskets, isn't it, from a, from a national perspective. And from a risk manager's perspective, that's scary. So, you know, we're going to have to deal with China and, and, the, and the China issues. Um, if we're not going to be able to export there, well, we've got to find alternate markets and easy for me to say because I don't produce wine and I don't dig iron ore up or coal out of the ground and send it over to China. So, you know, or, or do I farm lobsters? You know, so for me, it's easy to say that. It's very, very difficult for, you know, the people in those industries to change tact when you've got issues like that happening. But if we can deal with that, if we can be supportive of those industries, like, you know, geez, over Christmas, go and buy lobster, go and buy Australian wines, you know, help, help the industry out. It's, it's, it's really important. But I think th that the China issue, I think, will resolve itself over time. I think China wants what we've got. I think they need what we've got. And from that perspective, you know, things will, will come back a little bit and it'll improve. Um, it's a great opportunity for us in Australia, actually, to look at alternate markets. India is in a massive evolving market for us. Um, there's a lot of places that, you know, in India, they manufacture, you know, they're economical, they're, you know, just as, you know, if you think China's difficult to deal with, India is no different. Um, you know, it's, but it's an alternate location for us to bring products into. Um, you know, earlier, earlier this year, I was on, on radio in an interview talking about um, we really need to, you know, get some, you know, high-tech manufacturing back in Australia. So we're not reliant on, you know, product coming in from China, et cetera, from, from overseas. Maybe that's something that we should be doing. But look, for me, I'm just confident about 2021. We're, we're, we're going to be okay. My only concern is end of JobKeeper, that we've got, you know, unemployment issues in April. Interesting, Andrew thinks we'll be okay, and that's fine. You know, we all have to have our own, own opinions, but overall, I'm, I'm confident for 2021. That's great. I suppose, Andrew, any last kind of comments or thoughts before we wrap up? Yeah, well, I guess we're focusing uh, as very much through Steve on, on development, and uh, I think there's still a lot of work to be done on the finance end of development. I think banks are still... Uh, a little gun shy about financing to developers and, and investors. And I think there's got to be some sort of a process there to, uh, to build confidence within the banking sector towards uh, new development. 
We've, um, we're around about half the development of new apartments where, uh, compared to where we were five years ago. And there's no, it's quite interesting when you look at the, uh, the trend of uh, new development uh, for apartments over the last four years, uh, it's exactly the same as the trend for investor lending. Both of them have collapsed and um, that really shows some significant uh, issues, I believe, in terms of the, uh, the culture of lending towards those risk takers that we really need active in our economy, particularly for uh, residential construction. And, uh, you know, uh, we protect the banks. We don't, they don't have to compete. You know, there's only four of them, but uh, they've also got a duty to, uh, you know, also to create, you know, economic positivity. And that means being, you know, not as bunkered and hunkered down as they are now in terms of their lending policies towards, uh, you know, developers and investors. And, you know, I just hope we can uh, turn that around a bit next year. That's great. Well, thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Steve. It was really good to catch up and uh, been a super interesting year and, and an exciting year ahead coming up. Yes, hopefully less interesting. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. We want it to be interesting. We always want it to be interesting <laughs> because life would be dull without these sort of challenges in front of us. So maybe, maybe not as challenging, that's all. Right. And what would the doomsayers do? You know, they'd have to uh, give up on all their hysterical... That's to find a real job, Andrew. <laughs> That's to find a real job. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Uh, all right. All good. Thanks, everyone.